Welcome to our seminar with Fox Williams. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping in that this meeting is being recorded. Just send that out to people who didn't make it. Um, thank you very much, Fox Williams, for being here. And I'll pass over to Paul Albert to kick things off. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time. You'll have noticed that our clocks in this building show different times depending on which room you're in. So there's a three-minute time difference between the two offices. So thank you for coming so promptly. Thank you for coming so many of you. I think it's the first time I've seen so many people in this room since COVID. So it's really nice to be in a physical environment uh, such as this. So thank you for coming. Um, and part of the reason that we're having this physically, but also being recorded to show people afterwards what was said, was because Steve was absolutely adamant that he likes face to face meetings. So, thank you for that. Uh, our great thanks to our friend Steve at Fox Williams and the rest of the team. You're going to hear over the next hour or so three presentations that I hope will be useful to you, I'm sure will be useful to you. There may be some people arriving late and we may run out of chairs, in which case you may see me suddenly do a disappearing act and find some more chairs. That's a positive. Uh, it's a bit like leaving a table place out for a long journey to play anyway, hoping that it's going to turn up. Um, time's challenging at the moment. Is anybody in this room finding that business is easy? No hands have got up. All sorts of challenges that we're all finding. Uh, making life very difficult. A lot of our brands are reporting that buyers are going from payments on account to sales or sale and turn or consignment, for example. A lot of companies are reporting credit problems with buyers that before COVID would not have aroused any suspicion at all. So things are difficult. And those of us that are old enough to remember at high interest rates know that it can only get worse because there is more and more squeeze on, on smaller brands in particular by the big retailers so the subject that you're going to be hearing about particularly the last one i think will address some of the legalities of that um, and of course i haven't even mentioned the brexit words um, that's perhaps a word best not left uh, not, not dwelt upon too much in this room. So the three presentations you're going to have are one around pop-ups, one around director's responsibilities, and the third one that really does, I think, touch on the reason to venture some of the challenges that a lot of you in this room will be uh, facing is about getting paid, how to get paid from a legal point of view. We'll have four to five to 50 minutes of presentations, I think, and then questions and answers, questions with answers. Um, and then a drink, if you will stay with us for a drink. We have some wine, we have some soft drinks, so hope you'll stay and mingle. And Steve and his team usually don't rush off too early, so I think there's an opportunity there for you to approach them and talk to them. And um, they really don't like to uh, at all. So, Steve, thank you very much for volunteering to do this. Over to you. Paul, thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. It is uh, a delight to be here. Uh, Paul referenced uh, not seeing this many people since COVID. I would say not seeing this many people in this room even pre COVID. Mm. Uh, we are here today. Uh, Paul referenced the fact that it's challenging times. For sure, it is challenging times. Uh, Paul has referenced the three topics that we're going to speak about uh, during the course of the next 15 minutes or so. Um, the topics will be guided by the slides which are behind my left shoulder. Uh, for more information, you may wish to visit fashionlaw.co.uk. And before I hand over to the first of our speakers this afternoon, let me say that those of you who are not yet members of UKFT, I would urge you to become members of UKFT. UKFT serves a very valuable role so far as the industry is concerned in promoting what is important to the industry. And for sure, uh, a wee bit of help is needed uh, so far as the industry is concerned. Um, given government today. 
Okay, so our first speaker is going to be our colleague, Rebecca Tracy. Rebecca is the legal director in our real estate department. Rebecca's going to touch on pop ups. Rebecca's going to hand over to our next colleague, Sarah Carlton, who's senior associate in our corporate department. She's going to speak about uh, the scary issue of directors' responsibilities and liabilities. Or oh, more particularly, uh, how things can really happen to you that you don't wish to happen to you. And then I'm going to touch on the issue of getting paid, or at least trying to get paid. But without further ado, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you, Steve, and Paul, and um, thank you for letting me do the more positive element of the day. So hopefully we can start on a, on a good note and then we'll only go down and have a fun there. Um, so, yes, I'm talking about pop ups, um, which tend uh, to be becoming more and more popular for reasons that it's uh, a relatively cheap way to get your brand out there. Um, they are quite literally popping up everywhere at the moment. You see it um, uh, on, online um, with lots of fashion retailers essentially trying to influence their brand um, and their marketing reach without necessarily breaking the bank with the initial FA cost. But, are often associated with a more formal bricks and mortar and formal piece um, structure better. But with that said, pop-ups, they don't come free or without obligations. So it's important to make sure that you're getting the most out of what money you are spending on your pop-ups um, and what you're investing and that you can limit your liabilities as far as you can. So I'm just going to give a short rundown of some of the benefits of Host and pop up, um, some of the pitfalls, um, and uh, some key issues to be aware of when setting up and when you're back and running. And also, what to do when you come to the end of your pop up agreement, and um, probably perhaps at the end a little bit about uh, setting up the tag of the UK. So, I'm going to spend each time to go right here, <laughs> and we're going to continue. Um, so, a bit about the benefits. Um, what are they? Well, for, for the building owners and landlords, they see a pop-up as an opportunity to increase their footfall in um, their opportunity of where the building is, um, and also to boost other brands in the area that, that pass it already their tenants, and to charge prospective new tenants, and it makes sure that essentially what's otherwise they can premises potentially are being utilised and from a landlord's perspective they're going to be keen to uh, mitigate their rates liability um, and avoid paying um, business rate and rental premises if that's not So all these opportunities for landlords or the big opportunities to be as I say might not want to take a plunge with a full zone lease agreement and take on a long commitment for a new store. Um, so for retailers, usually with their strong online presence, pop up for a great opportunity to locate their goods, of course. They allow their customers to buy before they buy, they are having to deal with businesses. Um, and it also gives their customers a more physical and um, even emotional experience, which I think we're all still kind of craving at the moment. And I know just on we were chatting earlier and, and my personal perspective, you can get a longer lasting impression when you have that. Physical um, interactive experience in the village shop and pop ups generally being used to make that even more known. So, it's a slightly more kind of wacky or serious feel than shop. Um, and it gives retailers the opportunity to be more creative with the space because they know that the, the costs that they're going to be incurring are going to be relatively short here. Um, you might be thinking about making a move to a more permanent business presence, but not sure how lucrative it would be in a particular area. Um, and a pop up is going to assist you with that transition, um, essentially allowing you to test the waters without making um, a longer term commitment, particularly if you don't know the location very well. Um, as an example, there's a fashion brand called Eva in London. They were founded about two years ago. They're an independent retailer for fashion and beauty. Um, they helped pop up in uh, the yards of Covent Garden a few months ago this spring. And their aim is to try a physical space for um, sort of venturing in for both feet. And they were able to benefit from being around um, retailers that put a much higher high street profile, like the micro fees there and the sort of fees are there. So for them, it's probably relatively low risk venture um, for what's another one, the online retailer. 
On the other hand, the pop up might be the entire concept. Um, so, low design curve where uh, a platform or an independent designers they offer it exclusively either online or pop up. So, they can essentially move their location every few weeks. Um, so, rather than being tied to one area, it's a great opportunity for them to, to get that brand out there. And they tend to have the experience of anything from a speaker panel to um, a workshop. Essentially, just finish popping into the more full experience. Um, they just uh, launched the product in this store, enabling them to uh, sort of collaborate, I suppose. So, can kind of offer a more innovative customer kind of experience with the product. Um, and then it's a sort of community benefit for, for both um, the, the landowner and the retailer. They can also be a great way to create a high brand new product or experience. Um, I put it on the slide there, a picture of the few elements of previous that we collaborated with a few years ago. Um, this one, Louis Vuitton wouldn't sell these products in vessels alone, they were sold exclusively through worldwide products. Um, so, included in London, Miami, so here is the main similar cities. And what they did was they revealed the, the location just a few uh, sort of shortly beforehand on Instagram, creating a big app that was in high for the men's market. Um, the issue with that was that the stores ended up closing much sooner than anticipated. Uh, we don't quite know why, but it did spark suggestions that they ran out of too quickly or was creating too much hype. Um, or potentially help victims in black market details. So it's just a bit of a caution detail if you want to build the height of the new thing you can manage the property and then stop the rent market. Box I mentioned at the outset is not a new thing for them, but the pop ups um, are used. They generally come to the market um, from the landowner and fully fitted out. So for the retailer, you've got limited costs in getting that store up and running. Um, but one thing to check is that you can make sure that you can get your branding and signage and, and um, make sure that those requirements are over the you know, at the exit. A more traditional long term leasing arrangement will generally involve quite heavy fitting out costs from um, the, the tenants in the back there. Um, which doesn't make the pop-up seem a bit more inviting, especially if you're not sure about the location or um, the projected possibility of that store. And finally, for a marketing, they're often about uh, signs in quite established areas already or within a large store, meaning that the retailer can benefit from it for well, often for already, and they get marketing from other shopping through um, and in the areas so they can get great satellites or any customer exposure. And um, so that's the, the good stuff that we've been recruiting so far. But on the next slide, um, I'm just talking a little bit about some of the issues that you need to be aware of if you do want to venture into the world of products. Um, so before you jump in, uh, just consider about what type of legal agreement you're actually going to have to document your your uh, pop-up store. Many building owners pop-up shop grant the license rather than a lease. Um, you just need to consider what works best for you. Um, the difference is generally a license agreement is much quicker, easier to negotiate, um, generally meaning smaller legal fees. Um, and they tend to be on an all in place inclusive rent basis, meaning that there's no sort of hidden charge of an additional liability, which is obviously good news. It also gives a lot more flexibility for both landlords and tenants, um, or building owners and licensing fee. The key distinction between a, a formal lease and a short term license arrangement is that for the license, uh, the occupier doesn't have any right to actually explicitly um, occupy that space. But it might mean that the building can move around, uh, has to an apart the building or to another unit entirely on a pretty short notice. So if you have to get a lot of money, you're putting out for on Friday, that would be a bit better. It also means you can't exclude the building owner from the limited space at any time, so they can use that space in order to fit it better in conjunction with you. Um, but it does tend to mean if you've got more flexibility of leaving a case on of short notice, you would have a form of these agreements. So, by contrast, we might document a um, more sort of um, structured offer with a short lease rather than a license agreement. They're generally negotiated for a longer term, a fixed term, with no rights to the landlord to come in and interrupt or move you around. 
um, or kick you out, snatch you every couple of weeks, of course. Um, but they can also involve that within the charges. So the landlord probably will be charging you an annual rent as well as if it's charged for what I said, the current provider or the uh, common pass um, that's up to date. Um, as well as those that are charging, you would have to pay your utility and probably business rate that each on the rent as well. Um, so as I mentioned, license attendant does that with into one license fee. So if you look at the two options, um, at least looking a lot more financially attractive, um, then it might be because all the other costs are, are hidden and don't come out of the until later. So that it might be now before you make that choice. And just generally, whether or not a lease or like is the right for uh, you will depend on the specific situation. Uh, but it is important just to consider it beyond what if that looks like and how you're going to stop the answer and make sure you know what you're signing up to. Um, on the side, there's the bridling uh, in that seat, and that's um, probably more than our installation than anything else. So, certainly, even pre uh, a lease, it might be a simple concessionary agreement. Um, so, there's, there's going to be a wide range of Methods of documenting your agreement, but um, you just need to know what that looks like. Next thing I've put up there is the planning. When landlords are renting out space on themes of short term next of projects, it will be the, the planning permission for one tenant's use, certainly, and to do what you're trying to use it for. Um, so it is again important to check that the property that you're looking to occupy actually benefits from the permissions and licenses that you need to, to, to use it. During COVID, the plan was that they did the changes that you used between the four and half occupiers was much easier and you didn't have to go out to the plan to get consent. Um, but then they still be a planning permission for a specific building that has very specific planning conditions that might be restricted on the out of opening, use of music, um, say that whole food, and nights and outside the premises, that sort of thing, that, that, that can still catch you. Um, and it's just important to remember that the landlord, the building owner, might give you agreement, so yeah, you can do it all, do what you want, we don't care. Um, but they don't end up right on the plan as the same. Uh, and the landlord doesn't care as long as you're on the hook with that agreement. So it will be on you to make sure that you're checking the plan and um, not on the landlord, regardless of the landlord might have that or giving you the And finally, utility connection plan is really obvious, but often in short term, let this and pop up arrangements. There is usually sign very quickly and before you know it, you're on the hook for paying. Uh, the building you know, that the rent of the license fee, um, perhaps before you're even ready to trade. We quite often come across short term left, but seem to be plug and play. Um, so definitely you can just go in and play one and you're up and running. But very often, what we see is that the internet and telecoms connections just aren't ready or they're not fit for what we want to use them for. Um, and then when we do try to get the provider to get in, they can be slow, they tend to do things in an automated business rather than prioritizing things, or if you, if you do want to rest the rent, they'll have a higher rush fee for it. Um, so if you do have a sort of level of um, you requirements of online payments, you just make it And so that's setting up, what about, so the next slide is uh, when you're up and running, you don't need due diligence, you've got your agreement, you're in, you're going, great. Um, so the key points to consider whilst you're, you're trading, um, firstly, the extent of your repair and liability in your lease or, or license agreement is really important to make sure you know what that is and you're complying with it. If you have been well advised, if it's a short term left or, or very um, short term profit agreements, you should be taking on minimal if no repair and liabilities and then you're documenting the condition of the property and the that you that the access go in. If you've agreed a more fully repairing um, obligation, um, which is probably more of a longer term lease, that's going to oblige you to put the property back in for good, say, a repairing condition, regardless of the state that you took it in. So you might have to make improvements to the state of the property that you put it in. Um, this sort of pop up arrangement, not, that's not really what you're wanting, but it makes sure that landlords don't need to get that in there because you could end up with quite 
significant cost that you're not anticipating. And just bear in mind that you are putting this stuff to stick out in, you're likely to be going to have to reinstate that and pull it all out um, at the end of the agreement. Um, so just agree that at the outset as well, just think about the cost that you'll stick out and when you're prepared to be thinking again. Probably after that the um could be your um Harris takeover a couple of years ago and I imagine sit out and uh sign a shape on quite the touch of the um what they can say in order to go Um I mentioned before if you don't have an increased rent or license fee, you will need to make sure you have to retain different rates and charges, any service and charges. So at the least negotiating stage where the rent is all inclusive, we would really strongly put for a cap to the charge of fees. So you don't have to very short term agreements inadvertently, but essentially paying for the landlord's improvements to the longer term uh, life of the building. Um just a note on when it comes to new you will want to make sure that you're leaving on good terms. So you might be trialing a new venture, not sure of the level of interest that you'll get. So flexibility is quite important. And whether or not you agree with you for a license, you're going to probably want to increase some options to terminate early if you can. They need to be negotiated with the landlord at the outset and carefully drafted because very often what we see on both both sides of the coin is that uh, a landlord will try to take apart and take apart any notice that the directed line of break because um, we often only get one like from Cherry and get it wrong, then it could be on the hook for the rent for the rest of the term um, by being on the landlord's fair and then just out of the time. Particularly where the landlord doesn't have an option or anything that's in the building. Um, so, if the early asset is, is, is really crucial to you, you might be able to negotiate a rolling break where you can just serve a notice at any time to leave. That means you don't get one right to the challenge, so if you get it wrong or if you're not sure, you can you can issue another no a break notice. But that's likely to be pushed at the rental payments um, because obviously there's a lot more uncertainty from the landlord's perspective. Um, so the key there is broken right at the outset, but also when you're serving any broken to get that right as well. Um, Conversely, you, you might be a great success and want to be able to speak to the building owner as soon as possible to stop them from remarketing the space and just be wary of any landlord who doesn't want to reformalize the building in the right way because they might be considering the option in the background. And also, if you have reached an agreement with your landlord, perhaps you might be converting a, a license into the longer term lease because it's all gone well. Um, just make sure it's it properly documented again. And that could be a good point to negotiate terms as well. So, if it's been a, a, a mutual, um, a, a mutually successful, perhaps the, the landlord benefited from you and there, the tenants in the building benefited as well, then you might be in a stronger negotiation, negotiating position than you were at the outset. Um, that's most of what I want to say. I've got a final slide just about um, branching outside of the UK. Um, Pop-ups are used globally, I'm sure, um, but in some places, countries and cities, you can often are not in London, it, it's pretty really popular at the moment. Um, it's likely that all of these projects I've talked about will translate into the other jurisdictions that um, you might be seeking to uh, pop them in. Uh, personally, I, I, I can't advise you on real estate outside of England and Wales, uh, but we do have correspondence all the time globally, and you know, it's pretty much that's a lawyer who can help. But I did just want to flag a few factors uh, when to consider when we're setting up overseas. The first is insurance. As we're setting up in the UK, it's just important to make sure you've got all the rest of the insurances, so including a bit of liability. If you're not familiar with a country that you're seeking to set up in, it's just worth getting specific advice on a broker, even in the UK, that's a good idea. Uh, secondly, is the employment law. Employment laws and regulations can vary quite um, from country to country. 
um, many jurisdictions that could have uh, a much more really favorable approach than we do here in the UK. So just make sure that we check on that and that you're not going to fall out any local employment laws. The need to tax if you're a UK corporate company, but due to the coming and business establishment in a different country because you get up there, you might be subject to additional taxes in that country. Um, and probably the, the most important one on this list is to make sure you get the requisite tax advice and know what the liability and the are. Um, so, you know, the French you may receive. And then finally, local laws. There might be other local laws that you aren't familiar with, things like um, disability discrimination, health and safety is a really big one. Um, obviously, you don't want to be on the wrong side of any law, but some people that think your application needs to be quite damaged if you don't get it right. Um, so just make sure that you're you're able to speak to those and get quite a advice as well. And I think that's everything on me. I put the idea to pop up. Um, that's in Barcelona, I mean, it doesn't really have any relevance to what I'm talking about, but I thought it was all well, quite interesting. So, um, there we go. That's everything I've got to say on that kind of Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Paul. Um, as Steve mentioned, I'm a corporate lawyer at Oxfordian, uh, and I'm sure everyone of you has felt or seen the impact of the current economic situation. You've got disruption and supply chains. Uh, labour shortages, high costs, and um, it has been reported that retail insolvencies have increased by 56% in the last financial year, um, and it's likely that this trend will continue. So hopefully, but not hopefully, what I'm going to talk about is going to be relevant today. Um, now, I know many of you will probably be a director in your own business, or maybe a director in a business that you work for. Um, so I want to outline the potential personal liabilities that you could face in an insolvency situation, and also the responsibilities that you have as a director in an insolvency situation. So we go on to the first slide. So um, I've set out here the general duties that you have as a director of a company. Um, and these are codified in the Companies Act 2006. Um, I've put here in a second bullet point that all directors owe duties equally. So this is non-executive directors. This is directors who aren't registered at the company's house. So if you have a controlling hand in the company or you hold yourself out as a director, this also applies to you as well. Um, now, I'm not going to dive into each one of these duties today, but just to note um, in particular DG2, which says to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members, so its shareholders effectively. Now, it's a well known principle of English company law that a company has its own legal personality, so it's separate from that and it effectively shields its directors and shareholders from liability. Um, however, in um, insolvency, as a particular circumstance, that separate legal personality is pierced and you can face personal liability in certain situations. And that's what we're gonna look at today. So if we move on to the second slide. So let's just have a brief look at what insolvency is. So insolvency is when a company can no longer pay its debts. So you can't pay bills when they become due or you have more liabilities than assets on your balance sheet. Now, as a director, it's really important to understand when your company might be facing insolvency because this is when your duties to act in the interests of your shareholders will change and then you need to focus on the interests of your creditors. So as you can see here, as the company's financial position worsens, you then need to think about your company's creditors over and above that of your shareholders. And, and this is what's called the creditor duty effectively, and it's been recently looked at uh, quite a lot by the courts actually. And guidance has been provided on when the point at which you need to consider the creditors over your shareholders. So this is where if a director knows or ought to know that a company is insolvent, 
or if a company is bordering on insolvency or that insolvency is probable, then that creditor duty will start to arise. So where the financial difficulties of the company might be less severe, uh, the duty might be discharged by giving creditors interest appropriate weight and therefore balancing against them the, the interests of the shareholders if, if they conflict. But if insolvency becomes inevitable, that's when your duty for the creditor becomes paramount. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So this credit duty, this sort of um, making sure that you are acting for the benefit of the creditors, that's really important in these three potential offences that you could be liable for as a director. So the first is wrongful trading, and um, this is probably one that you might have heard of. Um, this applies to both current and former directors of a company. And this is where the director knew or ought to have concluded that there was no reasonable prospect of the company avoiding an insolvent liquidation. And the director then failed to take steps to minimize further potential loss for the company's creditors. So a resignation from the board, given that this applies to former directors as well, is not necessarily going to save the director from liability um, in these types of offences. And there is a six-year limitation period, which means an insolvency practitioner can look back to the previous six years. And as you can imagine, a liquidator doesn't look too kindly on a resigned director, particularly at the point of insolvency, uh, when the ship might be deemed to be sinking. So I'm just going to touch on fraudulent trading. So fraudulent trading is effectively the same as wrongful trading, but it's when there's a clear intent to deceive and defraud creditors, so that's called fraudulent intent. Um, and the important thing to note about fraudulent trading is that it's also a criminal offence as well, so you technically can get a prison sentence for it. Um, now this, as you can imagine, is um, more rare than uh, and wrongful trading, but important to note that it, it does and, it, and is prosecuted as well. And the third offence has been that of misfeasance, and this is where a director has been supplied or retained or become accountable for any property of the company or is found to breach one of their um, duties as a director. So there are the three main offences, and just taking a step back and um, thinking about the context of it. So, when an insolvency official becomes aware of a cause of action that could be capable of being pursued, which would benefit companies' creditors, they do have pretty wide discretion over, over what they do about that. So they would look at the facts of a particular case, and they would also consider whether the proposed director would have sufficient funds to contribute towards the, um, the debts of the company effectively. So... Um, it's what we see and what is generally seen in the industry is that it's often easier to bring a case on one of these offences against the director when the records of the company show a state of disorganisation. So there were no board meetings, there were no minutes of the board meetings, there were no management accounts produced, and the consultant practitioner can't effectively look at what decisions the directors were making at the time of the insolvency. And, and we do often see um, that with high profile insolvencies, officials do feel a duty to bring proceedings against directors when they believe there are viable claims. So, can you go on to the next slide, please? So, in addition to um, personal liability, you've potentially got direct disqualification as well. Um, so if the director is bound to commit one of the three offences that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the director can also be disqualified for a period of between two and 15 years where the director is deemed unfit to manage a company. And the insolvency practitioner would often look back at previous dealings with companies that the director had had and um, be deemed unfit, the director would generally um, have to display a lack of commercial property, which amounts to negligence or incompetence, but the whole track record is looked at effectively. Um, and when the company does become, if, if the company has become insolvent, other factors will be considered, like the director's cooperation with the insolvency practitioner, for example. So we're going to go on to talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, so if we go on to the, the next slide, please. 
So these are director responsibilities. So if you're becoming aware that your company might become insolvent or is heading that way, then you need to start thinking about complying with the insolvency rules. So I've set out here sort of a, a high level version of them, if you like. So the first one to seek information. So a director is judged not only according to their own knowledge, skill and experience, but it's by an objective test. So what would the reasonable person um, have, have done carrying on those functions as a director? Um, poor information for a director isn't an excuse. Directors should um, be informed and seek information about the financial information of their company. So just because you have a finance director doesn't mean that if you're such a different director that you, um, you escape liability. And obviously, if the road to insolvency isn't always linear, there's bumps, there's peaks, there's troughs. And um, if you're not certain of the level of risk your business is facing, then we do recommend you take um, you know, expert advice in those situations. So deciding whether to cease trading. So once you've got the information, once you can analyse the financial information, the general information of business, you need to consider whether you need to cease trading. And obviously tensions can arise between the positions of your creditors and the directors as to what the right decision is in that instance. Um, of course, you've got you know, financial creditors may want the company to continue to trade while potentially rescue negotiations are, are, are underway. And um, we do recommend again that you would seek you know, advice from an insolvency practitioner or a lawyer in that, in that situation. So that leads on to the next point. Um, and insolvency practitioners do look at whether you sought advice in good time. So there's no point you know, running a company into the ground and then calling up a lawyer or then calling up an insolvency practitioner. It's about getting that advice in good time because they can help and they can guide and they can suggest when you might need to stop trading and that type of thing. Um, and one point I want to mention here as well is that in your, you need to think about whether you might need to seek advice in your personal capacity as a director, because obviously um, when we're talking about personal liabilities, that's different from company liability. So you may need to get advice um, on personal capacity as well. So recently we've seen a huge amount of increase in clients asking for advice when they've received directors questionnaires. And these are questionnaires that insolvency practitioners send out to directors to gather lots of information about what happened in the run-up to insolvency or, you know, potential insolvency. And these questionnaires are designed to solicit information from you about the business failure. And they are designed to unearth information that may lead to one of those personal liability offences that I outlined. So um, directors do have a separate duty to cooperate with the insolvency practitioner and to fill out these forms um, accurately. Um, but again, we do recommend that you might seek advice in that situation if you're ever presented with one of these questionnaires because um, a lawyer or someone else can help you with answering these questionnaires. Uh, the next one is to cooperate. So cooperate with your insolvency practitioner as much as possible. Um, as many of our politicians would testify, you're just as likely to get into trouble for the cover-up and the alleged crime itself. So when deciding if the director should be subject to particularly like disqualification proceedings, for example, the insolvency service in the court will listen to the insolvency practitioner as to how in your capacity as the director that you assisted with the litigation process or administration process. Uh, the next one is record, record, record. So any doubt that your company is going through financial difficulty, you know, make sure your board minutes are up to date. Make sure you're recording in your management accounts. Make sure in your um, board meetings that your opinion as a director is recorded. Because obviously when an insolvency practitioner is looking at a company and looking at a board of directors, they're looking at directors individually. So your opinion as a director counts. Um, it's really important to make sure that these things are minuted as well. Um, and if you are obtaining professional advice, minute that as well. Make it clear that you're seeking as a board of directors to get that advice early on. 
Uh, the next point is communication. So thinking about informing shareholders and creditors, obviously it's such on a case-by-case -case basis as to how you might want to do that. But again, insolvency practitioners can help with that communication. Um, usually it's better to over-communicate, not always, but obviously it um, depends on the situation. Um, and finally, I just wanted to highlight personal guarantees. So a director can be personally liable when they've agreed to personally guarantee or secure the financial obligations of a company. So as I'm sure you're all aware, they're often requested by banks and um, they give a bank maximum protection for any loan taken out by the company. And as you, again, you can imagine it's, it's often easier to pursue an individual than it is a company for, for funds and to enforce its security. So whether your company is solvent or going insolvent, um, it's quite important to just think about uh, think about entering into a personal guarantee before you do. Um, so yeah, that's everything I have to say today. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so so what brands and suppliers need to know when it comes to getting paid? Uh, and in approaching this topic, I'm going to look at it from the perspective of prevention over cure. And I say that not least because prevention will be a lot easier, uh, probably more effective, and I can assure you a lot less expensive um, when it comes to cure, so far as legal fees are concerned. So if we can go to the next slide. So what is the current position? Some of you may have seen an item in the Times towards the end of August, which drew attention to the fact that the late payment rules that we have in place at the moment, and which are aimed at large companies, are largely being ignored. Indeed, since 2017, those businesses which are subject to these rules, um, which require them to publish on a half yearly basis, uh, what they're doing so far as uh, obligations in paying their suppliers are concerned, um, since 2017 to, uh, to today, uh, the number of businesses that are actually complying with these rules and uh, submitting half yearly reports has fallen by over a third. What is good, in one sense, although it still leaves a lot of room to be desired, is that when we come to look at the issue of late payments themselves, um, in 2018, so far as these businesses are concerned, 31% of them were making payments late. That's fallen marginally to 26% as at last year. I mention that because what large businesses do, smaller businesses tend to follow. And we can therefore draw from that that there is a significant number of businesses who are not paying their suppliers when we should be paying their suppliers. Indeed, the Times drew attention to the fact that many businesses are missing their contractual deadlines to pay suppliers. And I'll talk more about contractual deadlines or contractual terms in a moment. And then we come on to the issue, which is um, something of uh, a problem so far as the fashion industry is concerned. And that is when stockers decide that they are going to invite, and I use the word invite uh, with uh, some uh, trepidation, they're going to invite their suppliers to accept what are called retrospective discounts. Um, Retrospective discounts are typically a way of the customer, who stock as the retailer, paying you later and less than would otherwise be the case. That is all they are. And symbiotic, perhaps somewhat naively, I start from a position that actually the relationship between the supplier, the relationship between the brand and stock is should actually be something of a symbiotic relationship in terms of the better the brand does, the better the supplier does, the better the supplier, so the better the stockist does, the better the stockist does, the better the brand does. So wouldn't it make sense for both parties to try and work together and actually make payment on time? I'm probably am being naive. 
Um, and I say that in the context of the fact that unless there is some form of security in place, when you supply your stockists, when you supply your retailers, when you supply your customers, if you're further up the supply chain, unless there is security in place, you will rank as an unsecured creditor. So Sarah referenced back to companies that are going insolvent, and so far as unsecured creditors are concerned, they rank only ahead of the shareholders in terms of getting anything out of the company when the company has become insolvent. It's not a good place for you to be in. <laughs> Lastly, the reference to Harry Potter, which may cause some eyebrows to raise. Why is Harry Potter getting a mention? And that's because I'm not Harry Potter. I don't have a Harry Potter one. I don't have any easy answers for you. And I wish I did. But perhaps there are certain places where you can start. We we'll go to the next slide. The next slide starts with terms and conditions of sale. They are critical for all businesses that are selling goods. Absolutely critical. And I would like to say that it is the case that all businesses selling goods have them. I suspect, actually, the majority don't. And that's as true of the fashion industry as it is true of any industry. And why are they important? Because provided that the terms and uh, conditions of sale are properly incorporated into the contracts that you make with your customers, and that is a uh, heck of a proviso, but if they are properly incorporated, then they will set the terms upon which you are supplying what it is that you're supplying to the customer. They represent the terms of the contract. And if they have been properly prepared, then that would be good for you because terms and conditions of sale are intended to favor one party more than the other. And unsurprisingly, it is the seller that they're intended to favor. So, what should be addressed so far as terms and conditions of sale are concerned? I'll draw attention to three particular items which I would hope are addressed. The first is retention of title. In other words, title to whatever it is, ownership, property in whatever it is, is retained by you until such time as you have been paid. That you exclude the right of set off. The right of set off enables me, if, for example, I'm in a dispute with Sarah, and Sarah is supplying me with goods, and uh, me selling my store, for me to turn around to Sarah and say, Sarah, the goods you supplied me with are defective. Had you supplied me good, with goods that were perfect, I would have been able to sell them, I would have achieved the profit margin that I was hoping to achieve. And I do appreciate that I haven't paid you, but the fact of the matter is that I haven't paid you because I didn't sell them, and I didn't sell them because they're defective. And the loss that I have suffered is actually greater than the amount that I was due to pay you recognizing that you'll be operating probably on a 2.8 multiple. And so, Sarah, actually, I don't know you anything, but uh, because I'm going to decide my right to set off, you actually owe me. And that is something that we have done on various occasions acting with clients in the industry. It happens, beware. So how do you avoid that? You said that you exclude the right of set off. It's as simple as that. And interest. Um, interest rates at the moment, well, good news, according to the Bank of England, they're not going uh, higher at the moment than 5 or 40%. There um, is uh, a particular piece of legislation, uh, it is the Late Payment of Commercial Debt Interest Act. Glad I said that right. Uh, and that provides that automatically. There is an entitlement to 8% over base if the customer is late in paying you. But that also presupposes that the issue has been properly addressed in the terms of the of sale. It also presupposes that um, when it comes to seeking to collect 
on that unite group, so far as statutory law is concerned, that you behave properly to your customer because the court does have discretion to award less than eight over base. But I put as a final point before I move on to terms of condition to purchase defects and infringing copyright. And that has got very little to do with the terms, conditions of sale in terms of what they are, but more in terms of what you do. It is the case that repeatedly we see um, clients and perhaps uh, brands that we'd like to be clients use material which they have borrowed, um, that's a good word, borrowed from other brands. Effectively, they've copied the other brand's terms and conditions. We saw it recently. Uh, we have within the uh, firm uh, Fashion Law Group. We have a monthly meeting in Fashion Law Group. Uh, there was a meeting earlier this week of that group, the month of September, and one of the members of the team drew attention to a particular brand and thought it would be good if we could get with that particular brand. And then she pointed out that uh, the terms of use, which are the terms of use for the brand's website, were clearly copied from another brand, because if you go down the true term of use, the other brand's name gets repeated mentions. <laughs> Not really. It really isn't good. So, one, you're infringing copyright. Um, you are possibly, you know, you're, you're infringing copyright. Um, Bear in mind that in certain circumstances, infringement of copyright can itself be a criminal offence. But also, if the brand that you're copying the terms and conditions of sale from has incorporated into their terms and conditions mistakes, in other words, they haven't got their own terms and conditions of sale right, then you're simply replicating the mistakes that they've made. What you will find um, periodically is that the stockists that you supply, the customers that you supply, have their own terms and conditions of purchase. And unsurprisingly, these are designed to favor the purchaser, exactly what they say. So if you're in that situation, read really what it is you're signing up to. You may decide that you've got no choice. That you really do want to be stopped by net quarter, that you do really want to be seen in Harrods. Um, I get it, I understand it from a business perspective, but just be aware there's no point in being upset after the event because uh, your stockist has decided either not to pay you, or to pay you late, or to invite you to accept a retrospective discount. There's no fun in being upset. At least go into the situation with your eyes open. So please do read. And then we come on to the concept of what lawyers call the battle of the forms. So uh, to go back to the situation that I described a few moments ago where Sarah actually owes me some money, and I'll uh, have a word with you later about that. Um, Sarah's sent me her terms and conditions of sale at the outset, and I've responded with my terms and conditions of purchase. Um, which terms and conditions are going to apply? There are various rules to set out in law as to which terms and conditions apply. If you want to sell up, understandably, and Sarah should um, have been aware of this, make sure that it's your terms and conditions that apply, the terms and conditions of sale, you win the battle of the forms. By way of example, and I'm not going to be in our client, but a few years ago, uh, some of you will recall a footwear retailer, I'm not sure they existed in the um, but there was a footwear retailer called Grantano. And Grantano went into administration, I guess 2016, 2017, um, uh, we acted for a footwear brand, it supplied brand hardware with stock. Um, it had tried to apply what it regarded as its terms and conditions of sale. Uh, as I would regard them, they had the aerodynamic quality of an anvil, but they still tried. And uh, they lucked out. So huh, they woke up, they got wise. Next time round, because uh, Brentano emerged from administration, it 
they came to us and we said, right, these are the terms and conditions of sale that you need to use. And off they went. And we used those terms and conditions of sale because we had advised them how to properly incorporate the terms and conditions of sale into the contracts that they were entering into. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sir Philip Green uh, said something famous a few years ago, I think he did respect to uh, VHS, to the sale of VHS, and he said various expletives, but essentially if I give you the keys to my car and you go off and crash it, I'm not responsible. I paraphrase this to what he exactly did say, and he'll say he did use a few expletives. So this footwear applied valves supplies Grand Arno 2.0, because it's come out of administration. Grantano is cute, but not necessarily in a Disney-like sense. And they apply um, their terms, conditions of purchase, and we can see after the event, the event being that Grantano goes into administration for the second time, the correspondence emails came back and forward between our client and Grantano, each side trying to position their terms and conditions so to win the battle of the forms. And I have to say, the way in which Grantano engaged in that particular exercise was a sight to behold. It was, for lawyers, literally a work of me, and I'm sad, a work of art. It really was. And Grantano did go into administration, and we were instructed again, and we did have a merry time uh, negotiating with the insolvency practitioners, who, my memory served in correct, were Kate MG, who could have been one of the other um, members of the Big Four. It just goes to show you need to properly incorporate your terms and conditions, you need to have terms and conditions of sale that work for you. But what could you do? Well, you could seek, and Sarah referenced it earlier on, you could seek a personal guarantee from uh, the owner of the stockists, from the customer. Uh, I suspect usually you'll get turned down, but in some instances, it might be worth just doing that, provided, of course, that the personal guarantees itself are uh, properly, properly prepared. So, yeah, great, thank you. So, what else? Um, first of all, be alert. Um, be alert to what is happening in the industry. Be alert as to what is being reported, whether it is by creators, whether it is by Fashion United, Business of Fashion, um, you name it. There's a whole series of news feeds out there. Be alert to what is being said on social media about a particular stockists. So that if you're on the verge of sending stock to them, and put to one side whose terms and conditions are, are, are in place so far as the contract is concerned, you might decide to hell with what I agree to in terms of the terms. I'm not going to send the goods in to that in the stories because they're behind on payment. So be alert as to what is happening in the wider world. Having said that, I recommend you have a good relationship with your consultants. You may say that's a statement that the line in the office. I agree. Um, but I can assure you that there is uh, a particular client that we act for that is a supplier, as a fashion brand, is a supplier to ASOS. I know for a fact, because I've seen the correspondence passing between them and the parties, the good relationship with a key member of the buying team in ASOS worked to our client's favor and getting paid. So, good relationships are worth it. Keep good records. Again, Sarah referenced that, but literally in the insolvency context. Um, but keeping good records will enable you to stay on top of what is happening. You'd be surprised, uh, hope you'd be surprised, the sorts of things that we see in terms of the records that are kept when the goods go in. And we say to, um, we say, right, okay, so, and then we see this and we see that. And for reasons known to the client, the client then decides that the uh, carpet tiles in our offices are far more interesting than get us, because they don't have the records we would otherwise wish to see. Be prepared to act. Um, Sarah referenced, and 
the issue of um, wrongful trading. Um, she referenced uh, not being able to pay debts because they do you. Um, be prepared for that means that if it does come to a point where you're not being paid and you should be being paid, then you may decide, well, the hell with that interest stock is. I am actually going to issue what's called a statutory demand, which is a precursor uh, to apply to the court for a petition to wind up. There is another quickware uh, brand that I'm not going to name. It was a supplier to a well-known retailer that has just announced that it's ending, it's ending, if I've got the story right, uh, it's catalog uh, production, so you may be able to identify it. Um, the retailer decided not to pay our client, and uh, we were instructed right with time, uh, right to time, right to the stockist, so tracking it uh, with the issue of the statute of demand, that was ignored, we issued the statute of demand, uh, we were contacted by solicitors acting for the stockist who said, you could not do that, we uh, outlined is X, Y, Z, and we said, well, we can, we have, and furthermore, if you, the statute demand is not honoured, uh, or if you decide to challenge it, because that can be done, then we will um, counter, we will go for you. I find what pain. And ultimately, if worst comes to worst, uh, think about an action in the small case court, something you can do yourself. You don't need a lawyer to do it for you. Um, in contrast, I would urge you not to necessarily engage in using social media to sound off uh, about uh, particular stock issues that paid you. Um, that can have uh, consequences for you, and um, it's not good. It, furthermore, in my view, it doesn't look professional, so I'm suggesting you don't do that. Uh, lastly, uh, if I can, let me just draw attention to a couple of things uh, that Rebecca touched on. Uh, if you're allowed to do so. So, uh, Rebecca mentioned in the context of pop ups, um, if you build up hype, make sure that um, in, your, uh, in the pop up, in that you're offering food the pop up, make sure that you manage it. And I would very much echo what Rebecca has said. Not for anything I had to say with regard to the issue of sale of goods, but with regard to the issue of consumer law. There is consumer law out there which says that if you build expectation as a as a uh, brand and you can't deliver on that expectation, you can be liable to consumers. So do be aware of that. And Rebecca also referenced uh, the possibility of having pop-ups outside of the UK. And if you're going to go down that particular route, make sure you put your registered trademarks in order. Uh, do not do as uh, another uh, brand, a brigade brand, that seems to mention those quite a few times to be talk, but it is a footwear brand. It has been shown this week at Looking in Milan. And I know for a fact, you know, it was shown there as fine customers in Europe. It hasn't got an EU trademark, which, to my mind, given the simplicity of it, is just silly. So, um, that's what I had to say in the context of uh, getting paid, or hopefully getting paid, and a few other observations in respect to what uh, Rebecca had to say. And now, for excuse me, I'm going to have a word with Sarah to share this coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask, I was going to add to what you said actually, Stephen, because one of the things that we're finding a lot of UK at the moment is coming to decide they want to go and do a pop up uh, in the European Union. And if I can say, by a show of hands, who has a British passport in this world? So anyone with that ends up is not about itself to end the public in the European Union. So who has a European passport? Yeah. So we all need to talk to you. So, so many of the rules have changed, and we're seeing a lot of companies also, particularly in the United States, and this goes back to something we were about to say, talking about the importance of getting tax advice. Companies Jumping on a flight to New York, setting up a trunk show, and 
taking a whole load of samples with them, which they may or may not have taken on an ATA car, may or may not be able to bring back into the UK, and then suddenly express surprise once they've made the sale, when the American IRS contacts them and says, we'd like you to pay us for sales tax, you should collect to the state of New York, and by the way, you're operating as a US company, therefore we'd like to level um, tax on your business based on your global turnover. So the importance of tax in these international uh, environments is really very, very important indeed. So I know that my colleagues and I spend a lot of time preparing companies for the uh, how to survive and thrive in the context of Brexit with third party logistics. And a lot of these a lot of companies actually forget the tax side of it. They they get to the EU Yori, but forget that they actually are still invoicing from the UK. So tax is really, really important. And nobody ever wants to, in my view, create an excess to pay tax in the United States if my American friends don't actually understand how that works. So thank you very much.